opening slide graphic text title, Connecting Humans and Nature Through Street Gardening with Emma Cutting. Image of Emma Cutting, text, Purpose Matters Conference, logos belonging matters and talks that matter, dot net. Hello everyone, thank you Emily for that beautiful introduction and hello. I'm talking to you from South Melbourne in Melbourne, Australia, which is and always will be Bunurong Boonwurrung land. Just to build on what Emily was saying, what I would love to share with you this morning is an overview of our community not-for-profit organisation, the Heart Gardening Project, and also give you a window into our thinking around street gardening. In particular, how the power of street gardening is creating renewed purpose and connection for people and land in our urban environment through deepening, strengthening and building communities. Communities not only of humans, but also our flora and fauna. So let's get going. So what we do, we joyfully connect humans to humans, humans to nature and nature to nature. And we do this through street gardening and public plantings. We're a new organisation. We started in 2020, but boy, we've had a busy two years. So far, we've physically helped to create over 70 street gardens and plant over 6,000 plants. With the help of our neighbours and local nurseries, we've given 600 plants away. And where we've been designing and setting up things like projects like the Melbourne Pollinator Corridor, which I'll talk more about later. The Heart Gardening Project connects to address disconnections. With humans to humans, loneliness and isolation and depression are in epidemic proportions. And with this comes an immense disconnection, not only from um, people to their neighbours and their communities and their, but also the land and themselves. So disconnection is at an all time high amongst humans. Humans to nature, cities are growing. So it's expected that by 2050, most humans will be living, uh, so 70% of humans will be living in an urban environment. And of course, at this point, most cities are designed to separate humans from nature, which is absolutely not what humans need because we are a part of nature. Plants, animals and ecosystems are disappearing. Habitat loss and habitat degradation are the number one cause of this. And of course, all these disconnections contribute to climate change. And in the urban environment, it comes up with things like the urban heat island effect, water retention issues, um, soil health issues and extreme weather events. I started the Heart Gardening Project feeling all of these disconnections really deeply. I was emerging from 12 years of chronic fatigue syndrome, which is a, a mighty lonely journey, I must say. Also, um, I love South Melbourne. I love where we live. I've been here for 20 years. But definitely the asphalt sea around me was really starting to get to me. We had a daughter and I didn't want her growing up thinking that this moonscape of a landscape was okay. Didn't have a garden either. World leaders were saying, you know, Sir David Attenborough was saying we must rewild the world. And the beautiful Robin Wall Kimra was saying, as we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. And then the United Nations um, declared that this decade was the decade of ecosystem restoration. Of course, then the Black Summer bushfires happened, and really all of this. <laughs> meant that I was looking at these spaces coming up in a really different way. So I saw these spaces all around us in between the asphalt. And I went, what, what potential do these have? And I realised 
that we need to fill these barren spaces with gardens for our critters. We need to get street gardening. We need to turn our moonscapes into landscapes, into heartscapes. Like this. So now I'd love to talk a little bit about our barren spaces and a bit about street gardening in order to get to, you know, the power of street gardening. I'm not going to go through this list, but you can see that the barren spaces around us, and I don't know if you might have seen these already, it is a good thing and a bad thing because once you see them, you can't unsee them. <laughs> um, but nature strips are the ones I just want to focus on a, a little bit here for two reasons. One, they're the only public land where residents, and this is, this is across Australia, across all councils, where residents are expected to do a, a level of maintenance along with council. Two, they cover so much land, you wouldn't believe it. There was a study in Melbourne and it showed that 7% of our total land is nature strips. That's over 36% of our public green spaces. And in the city of Port Phillip, where we are, that is almost 360 acres. What an opportunity. So street gardening has been around for decades. This is nothing new. However, it hasn't really been thought about as its own type of gardening. I, in my <laughs> hundreds, thousands of hours of mulling and street gardening out by myself early in the morning, late at night, talking to people, I've realised it's, it's really different from guerrilla gardening, private gardening, government plantings. And there are challenges, of course, and there are constraints, but Essentially, you don't need to be a great gardener to be a great street gardener. The mindset is arguably more important than anything else. And what I feel it is, is an immensely powerful action approach mindset combo. With your action, you're creating a public garden outside or often it's outside of your home so it's in a public space that is power in itself then the approach of observation and immersion so looking in and awareness from looking from being in to the site is power again and then you put your mindset on top of this and that determination generosity positivity resilience you know, practicing resilience, community-centered mindset. This way of looking at street gardening addresses all the disconnections I have mentioned. And the power, the power of street gardening is so immense. I have been, um, I have been through many challenges, many challenges large ones and small ones. And I am continuously blown away by the power, the positive power of street gardening. It engages people of all ages, abilities, socioeconomic backgrounds and cultures. It, it ticks all the boxes socially, environmentally and economically. So there's something for everyone in there, which means that people will talk about it. People, there's always something to talk about with someone else. And it works as a social icebreaker. And I think this is one of the biggest things that I have noticed is that when, you, when one goes out into the world, it's so, I, social icebreakers are so few. In fact, the only one, um, I've been able to even come up with really is when you buy something. But street gardening works as a social icebreaker directly and indirectly, whether the street gardener is there or not. Of course, when the street gardener is there, you can say hi, you can smile, you can have a chat. 
If the street gardener isn't there, then you're engaging with what the street gardener has given and it's care and you're engaging with their care. And so a tiny garden, one metre by one metre, that's maintained and safe with that foot traffic going by every day can create such immense flow on effects. Even just like one day someone sees a bit of litter in that garden and they go and they pick it up. And that is street gardening. So that's the power. That's how you create positive change. So for me, it's about care. Street gardening begets street gardening. Care begets care. Enough of the theory, enough of the words. Let's see some gardens. So here we are. This, is, this was a car park. Uh, I was watching this for, uh, I've been in the area a long time. So this was like this the entire time. And a year, and that's my lovely daughter. She was three at that, at that point just for some scale. It's not huge, but it was a real eyesore. And we turned it into something absolutely beautiful. It took a lot of work. But now I know because locals tell me that they, they say that we used to avoid that space. Now we walk past it. So again, what the power of street gardening here is, is that it's increasing positive foot traffic. This um, was a place where people would use syringes, dump a lot of rubbish. It still happens occasionally, but a lot, lot less. And we've got people living right alongside here that come and weed voluntarily, put logs in and just generally enjoy it. And here's another example. So this is government land. This, this is land uh, that's part of the Department, Families, Department of Families, Fairness and Housing. And again, I watched this space sit there as wood chips for many, many, many years. And we were able to turn it into this. And this space of 100 square metres and the space before, the biodiversity and the nature that has come in has been incredible. The response from the people around this space has been incredible too. I must say that with the public housing uh, right next door, this has had to, this particular site has had to be very, very gentle. We've had to be very gentle and slow, but but that's been a wonderful part of the journey, and it's been so great to to get to know the residents here. This is another example, and this is a nature strip. I don't know how many of you have nature strips out the front, but great example. So what we did, we took six houses in a row, and took up all the lawn and or not the lawn there if you can see up there it's just dirt compacted so compacted from so many feet and we've turned it into a beautiful biodiverse garden that is still safe that it's still accessible that's still looking after the trees we have park towers just up to the right of this garden and we have uniting care um housing just next door as well where a lot of people live by themselves the conversations this is as far as I've gone away from home I knew no one in this area so really fascinating to start from scratch and what I've found here is that a lot of those people in the uniting care they stop and talk and they're so grateful and they're so lovely one guy came past the other day and he's always got his hands going and he's often muttering under his breath and he's going oh it looks really really good oh, and he kept on walking it's like yeah great awesome have a great day kept on walking went past the garden he stopped turned around he's like oh you know it's just it's not it's not manicured i like that i went oh and that's just brilliant. It's brilliant to hear these things because, again, when we're not there, they feel it's their garden. And I, I love that. And oh, here's me, if you didn't already notice this. <laughs> so on the left, 
this was where it all started in this what's called a tree pit or tree square or a um, tree plot. It's basically cut out in the asphalt around a tree. And that was me in 2016, pre-child. On the right, this was a couple of weeks ago after we won um, a very, very large campaign around uh, against council to um, keep street gardening. And um, I, I'm yes, you can obviously see I'm very happy, but what you can't see, unfortunately, because I'm jumping up in the air, is the beautiful gardens all the way up the street. There are so many of them. Now it's we we live in the most gorgeous street. So what is the Heart Gunning Project working towards? I would love to talk about our approach and so many things, but we just don't have time. But basically, we're creating the Melbourne Pollinator Corridor, Australian first initiative, and we're scaling it. We're encouraging and enabling communities to street garden successfully. So this means not, not just getting people out onto the street, street gardening, but getting people staying there. So managing expectations because there are constraints and there are challenges. Also refining nature strip guidelines around Australia. So really looking at our woefully, most of them, most, not all, but woefully, um, most of our nature strip guidelines are so behind the times. They really need a they need to think a little bit more about the community, let's put it that way. And I wanted to quickly talk about the Melbourne Pollinator Corridor. I wanted to show you this map. So the Melbourne Pollinator Corridor will be, when it's finished, an eight kilometre wildlife corridor, joining the Royal Botanic Gardens to Westgate Park. Two huge, but actually still isolated green patches that run alongside the um, Birrarung, the Yarra. We're looking at 200 gardens in here, um, about 18,000 plants or at least 18,000 plants. We've worked with over 20 scientists and specialists to get the design and set up going. And we're looking to do this in the next couple of years. This is going to be community led and maintained. The yellow dots, just so you know, are the gardens that are already done. The blue dots, of which there are many more now, <laughs> the blue dots are sites that are in various stages of happening. So this is really, really exciting. And as I said, it's an Australian first. And we're looking to, the wildlife corridor is for native pollinating insects. And here are our communities. So our communities of humans and critters and plants that we are helping all together. We've got scientists, we've got residents, we've got volunteers, we've got kids. We're giving away plants. We're doing as much as we can to help people, all people, to, create, to garden or help us create more gardens. Our plant communities are mostly Indigenous, so we're really looking at strengthening genetic diversity with plants and with the critters. But we've got these beautiful, I wish I had my cursor, my cursor's not working at the moment, but we have most, most of these are Indigenous plants, which mean that they're local to our area. And this is what I absolutely say, go to your Indigenous nursery and have a look at what beautiful plants you can plant. Our critter communities, we're looking at butterflies and our nighttime pollinators, moths, our wasps, our beautiful native bees. I wanted to give you a selection of native bees to look at because they're all so gorgeous and so different to the honeybees, which we love very much at the Heart Gardening Project, but they are introduced and our native bees do need more help than the honeybees. Honeybees will always be there whether we, I should qualify that, they'll always be there if we plant flowers. But what we're doing is designing first for our native pollinators. And then we have flies, arguably better pollinators than bees, interestingly enough. Beetles, bugs, spiders. 
and here we go. So what can you do? So much. Whether you have a nature strip, a garden, some pots, whether you can physically garden or not, you can do so much to create the connections that I've been speaking about. You can create a street garden or street gardens, but start small. I do recommend that. You can plant Indigenous plants. You can volunteer. Of course, you can volunteer with the Heart Gardening Project, but there would be plenty of regenerative and restoration projects going in your area. Get together with your neighbours. If you don't have a nature strip, find someone that does. Get together with them and create something. You can donate funds, energy, cards, seeds, relish, thank yous, smiles. All these things plus so many more are what has fueled me and buoyed me through the last three years because um, so far I've given my, you know, I've invested my own time into the Heart Gardening Project and when I get a card or some seeds or a plant or a thank you, it just means so much. If you can see that someone is caring outside of their own home or even inside, it doesn't matter, but if you can see someone is caring care back in whatever way you can. And of course, you can learn more about street gardening and go to our website. And that, I suppose, what I'd like to end with is when we care for our plant and critter communities in public spaces through street gardening, we're not only connecting to nature, but to ourselves our family, our neighbours, our community, our land and our planet. And there is immense power and immense purpose in this. Thank you. Closing slide graphic text with thanks to Emma Cutting, Crowdcoms, Purpose Matters Conference 2022. This video was made possible with the support of an information and capacity building grant through the Department of Social Services, produced by Belonging Matters. Belonging Matters makes every effort to provide accurate and up-to-date material. However, information is subject to change and our materials for reference only. This video was filmed on the land of the Rwandari Wairuang peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. Logos Belonging Matters Talks That Matter .net. Graphic text. More Purpose Matters conference videos. To watch more videos from the Purpose Matters conference, please head to free videos on the Talks That Matter website, talksthatmatter.net. Logos belonging matters, talks that matter.